Hello, today we're going to basically finish up this uh, grabbing of low-hanging fruit on one's way to not cheap, but uh, hey, nothing's free, but comparatively low-cost uh, audiophilia. Um, and what you have here is arguably one of um, the top speakers of the 70s and early 80s um, and in particular the uh, tweeter at the top which is a silk dome uh, some call it you know colloquially the uh, white dot because of the center um, exposed section there that you can see into the white inner silk uh, uh, driver. Um, it's the Peerless Tweeter. It's manufactured, uh, I think it's Dutch. Um, but that company has been bought out by, I think, an Asian firm. It's changed hands a lot of times. Um, and even before that, Polk switched to in-house tweeters in the mid-80s that were not as highly regarded. Um, and the rest of the speaker is actually pretty simple. It's it's a box speaker. It's not a it's a mid size. Um, they're best uh, sat up off the floor. I have a couple of IKEA small stools that sit up about eh, a little under two feet off the ground. So. If I'm sitting in a chair, these nice uh, peerless tweeters are pointing directly at my ears. Is That's what you want. Um, and then the rest of it is basically, you could basically pretend that this is the speaker right here. That is not a speaker. That is the basically the front of what would normally be a, a driven, you know, a, a speaker. It is a passive 10 inch woofer. What that means is that instead of a base port in the back or a completely sealed cabinet, there is this um, flexible, you know, front half of a speaker, but there's no voice coil, there's no wires going to this. This is basically a base port that you don't get any chuffing or, or you know, air movement out of. This moves like a, a subwoofer, and it emits sound, in my opinion, I'm biased because I own these, a superior sound uh, to, a, to a, a traditional speaker with a, a voice coil and, and, and wires going to it, and, and it actually moves under electrical power. This is just air that drives this. So, why is, besides, what in my opinion is smoother, more realistic bass, a clearer bass, less muddy. Um, what, why does this matter? Well, your amplifier is only driving these. This is basically a small bookshelf loudspeaker with the ability to reproduce low frequencies. And it, it's, it's a eh, ballpark 90 dB efficient. Uh, it, it's, this is not a Klipsch, a Klipsch horn. You're not going to I think these are like minimum 10 watts. 10 to 20 watts is like low for these. But you can get away with a, a, a more powerful tube. One. If you have like a 15 watt per channel tube amp, you could you could use them with these. I wouldn't recommend, you know, if you're going to try a little 2 watt, you know, tube amp setup, these are not the speakers for you. You're going to need like a horn speaker for that. So they're not these 100 dB efficient, you know, clip horn type speakers, but compared to, you know, if this were, if this woofer were to be a traditional woofer, um, I have a Harman Kardon HK3490 receiver that's 120 watt per channel and it's a high current capability uh, setup, you know, th that will blow these speakers. So I don't have a power problem, but what I'm saying is that if you're looking for an extremely easy to drive, efficient speaker that's not power hungry, um, you know, 
these are good. These are a good candidate because you're really only driving this. You know, that that is is a pretty efficient design. It's not it's not what I would call a power hungry speaker. Uh, they're also very good at, at you know in conjunction with the proper amp pairing, as with any speaker, they're good at producing bass at very low uh, volume levels. So you don't have to crank it to get bass out of these. And it's a very smooth, rounded... When I first got these, um, I, I had been used to traditional three-way speakers, and I noticed on jazz recordings, you know, a lot of them are upright string bass, you know, that you know are plucked by, by hand, rather than the electric bass, uh, especially, you know, pre-fusion jazz. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a very distinctive sound uh, that, yeah, and this is where you get into the geekiness of, oh, well, do you hear the, the, the sound of the finger moving over the string uh, and the recording and, and all these details of the artists interacting with their instruments? And in my opinion, with a passive radiator, a passive woofer, I have to say it's it's not BS. I actually notice more detail and the lower end of the spectrum, uh, an end of the spectrum that, frankly, is in my opinion and for my ears harder for speakers to to. It's it's very easy, especially if you have a tweeter as good as that. Oh, it's revealing at the top end and yada yada yada. It, getting low end. And and detail, that's a little harder. And to me, you get more low end clarity, and and you don't lose detail on the low end with this design. And I think that's why you know Matthew Polk, when these were designed, was there, was still involved with Polk Audio. Um, these are the seven Bs. It's a revision of the Monitor Seven. Um, these are a 1981 model. And the reason why you see some crossover components here, which I will detail, and that these are low-hanging fruit, if you can find these and you can do some work to them, basic mechanical work and basic electrical soldering, um, I call them low-hanging fruit because in today's dollars, adjusted for 40 years of inflation, these are $1,400 speakers. I did not pay $1,400 for these. I'm not even sure that I paid $200. I think I remember paying, I mean, maybe 100 on eBay. Now, you also see this contraption here, which I'll, I'll detail now for you. And that has to do with this guy. This is a what is referred to in the industry called a mid-bass driver. It's the, <clears throat> if it didn't have the assistance of this large radiator, this passive radiator, it would be, it would be a full range speaker. Um, you know, a, a fuller range speaker. It would have to deal with the bass as well as the, everything that this tweeter up here was not responsible for. That's a lot of frequency. So this takes the stress off of this. This can focus on the the um, the mid and and the upper range of the bass. And this kind of takes some of the stress off of this mid bass driver for the, the lowest uh, frequencies. Um, but what happens with these is they're very good, but you can see this moves, and uh, you know this moves. I could push this, and you know that moves. This was not moving. The voice coil was literally frozen to the magnet of the speaker when I bought these. And it, whether it occurred in shipping or they sold them like this, probably because they didn't think they sounded good. Obviously, if your mid driver is frozen, your speakers aren't going to sound good. What happens is the epoxy they, they glue the magnet in place with in the factory fails. 
Makes sense. At the time, they were closer to 30 years old. And, you know, after shipping and moving around and, you know, and these have had a, not the easiest life in the world. I'll show you, I mean, you can see, uh, these are just a veneer. Um, Polk was starting to, and I'm not sure that these were ever uh, extremely high end. These might have always been particle board and, and laminate uh, vinyl veneer. Um, but you could see how there's a, somebody dropped them there. Um, you know, so yeah, I'm sure people move them around. I've moved them around, you know, several times since I finished grad school and moved out of the house and all that. But, you know, the, these epoxy, the center magnets, you know, they, they lose their, their hold and they eventually break and they suck themselves right to the voice coil and freeze the speaker in place. That's actually not that hard, especially now my dad helped me build this. Uh, but he designed this jig that it's a split piece of PVC uh, pipe collar that you basically, you know, you can, sp you can spring it. Uh, it's a spring and you can um, put it as a collar around the speaker, uh, the frame of the speaker, and you use the, the uh, hose clamp to clamp it down. And these thumb screws, um, they, you can see we drilled holes around, evenly around, and you can use these to precision, um, you squirt your epoxy in there, I don't think we used a terribly fancy, you know, epoxy. It's something you can get at Home Depot or Lowe's, two-part epoxy. And you epoxy it, and then you use these to center the voice coil uh, and magnet, just as they would have been from the factory. And, I mean, it's a pretty fine thread he used on there, if you look. So, yeah. You can get pretty darn close to the factory, and... I think we left them for 24 hours, and they've been holding, I mean, I'm going to knock on wood here, for close to 15 years that way. Can't believe it's been that long. So that was great. But you know, this past year, as I started during this coronavirus thing to just get bored around the house and say, you know, I'm going to look at my, my audio. I feel like I'm not getting all I can out of my system, and speakers are, you know, that's the common area you spend money on first. But these were, I didn't know how expensive they were, but I knew Polk Audio, even today, it's not a low-end brand. Yes, they deal more in the consumer market and the, the mid-range and lower range than they used to, but you can spend $6,000 on a pair of Polk speakers if you want to. They still sell very high-end stuff. So I knew back in the 80s, the early 80s, these are 1981. Uh, I know because I saw stuff written 1981 all over the inside when I dealt with these components that I'm going to talk about briefly here. Um, you know, these were not cheap speakers. So I'm like, well, what if I just redo the crossovers? Because I knew these were coming up on 40 years. Um... I'm not an electrical engineer, but I know enough to know that uh, electrolytic capacitors like this one, they don't have a shelf life of forever. They go bad. They, they age. And they don't age well. So I thought, well, okay, I was literally going to click the mouse to spend $2,800 on a set of um, high-end loudspeakers. I won't go into which ones I was looking at. I was actually looking at a couple different models. I'm like, oh, what if I can get these Polk sounding better? And then spend money on my electronics. Um, and I actually did just pull the trigger on a really good phono preamp. Because um, that's the, probably the weakest link in my whole system right now. Because I was right. 
the speakers didn't actually need that much help. About a hundred dollars and um, Mundo from Sonicap hand matched uh, capacitors and, and I think Mills resistors uh, later. And I'm going to link where I bought them, which ones I bought. Um, and, you know, I think $100, and that was including shipping, to make these sound, in my opinion, you know, I, I wasn't alive in 1981, so I can't tell you what they sound like brand new. But I can't imagine they sounded any better brand new. Just simply replaced these old sand cast uh, resistors with the uh, mills and um, this is a you know four and a half ohm uh, unit and I can get the focus here uh, sometimes the focus doesn't want to play right and um, this is a you know some people say you don't need to replace this this is a the 12 microfarad uh, it's a mylar type capacitor versus this electrolytic. These electrolytics basically like dry out. And this is a 34. Um, microfarad. Uh, so this is high frequency for the pure uh, part of, I think the mid to low frequency. There's a coil in there uh, as well. The coil is, it's a coil. It's not gonna, unless it's physically damaged and you can see it with a naked eye, that's not gonna be a problem. And, and, and that actually, from what my research online indicated, is, is, is harder to match. Um, it's literally a coil of copper wire. Um, and that's for your, your low frequency. So, um, but I replaced all four of these, and let me tell you what, these speakers are, you find out what uh, roughly $1,400 in today's money got you. It's a very good speaker. It's, it's, and I understand why the people rave about these peerless tweeters online, and it's, it's, the dynamics of this speaker are excellent. It's it's very quick, especially with the um, low hanging fruit part one. The good speaker cables going into the banana jacks, because these have um, you can use either banana jacks or um, the uh, uh, traditional just regular bare speaker wire. These these unscrew right here, um, but. My, you know, $50-ish worth of gold-plated banana jack heavy gauge uh, shielded speaker cables from Amazon, I mean, it, these things really sing. And, you know, again, that passive woofer and the peerless tweeter uh, combined with, uh, you know, replaced, you know, I mean, these components are, are 40 years old. It, how could these not, you know, need improving? Um, but I'm completely satisfied. I might upgrade my speakers within the next three to five years, depending upon how long these last and, you know, my budget and my tastes. But, I mean, I'm really satisfied. And so if you adjust for inflation and all in, I mean, that we probably had lying around the house. It was my father's time which he's a retired uh, Lockheed engineer, so, I mean, and he dealt with manufacturing his whole career, so I mean, this is like taking candy from a baby for him. And it, it was a nice father-son project. Um, and I'm thankful to, you know, it, it's nice that I got to spend time with my father like that. We, we live 2,000 miles apart now, but, you know, so if I had to come up with this myself, my point in rambling about this is that, yeah, that would have been a little bit harder for me. I think there are some projects online that are similar to this, but that was cheap. That's dirt cheap. That's less than $10 at Home Depot, okay? The speakers were, I don't know, I think including shipping, 
you know, max $160. It was definitely under $200. I can't find the original eBay records. It's, I mean, because it's 15 years ago. So my emails have kind of gone astray since then. Um, so let's say all in, and I'm probably rounding up, $300 US dollars in today's money. You have a pair of speakers that, you know, to, to get something equivalent, you're going to have to spend $1,400. That's some low-hanging fruit right there. And, um, you know, the crossovers are very big, very easy to work on. I recommend a, um, I'll pick out a solder, what's called a solder sucker or a solder remover. It's basically a hollow tip soldering iron with a high temperature silicone bulb, kind of like the bulb your doctor squeezes uh, to take your blood pressure on an old blood pressure meter, uh, it tightens up around your arm. You know that bulb; it's red high temp silicone because it's literally sucking molten solder inside of it. Um, but you desolder these components and you solder in in the exact same order the resistors and capacitors you get. Um, it's it's very easy. It probably takes if you're handy with a screwdriver, it takes like ten minutes per speaker. And, you know, I, I, can't, I can't think of any cheaper, easier way um, to get the sound quality that I'm getting out of these speakers uh, for, you know, you know the, the, the kind of low-hanging fruit that, that, the, that these, are, these are like right in front of you. Immediately now, people, I think the word's out a little bit about these. These are, these were highly regarded speaker, regarded speakers in their day, and the uh, finding them on eBay is, is probably not as easy as it was in 2005 or 2006 or whenever I got these. But you know, you can still find other makes and models. Um, if you can find something with this Peerless Tweeter, I mean, they they know what they're talking about with this Peerless Tweeter. Um, it is really a good unit. I'm sure there are better units today. I can't tell you what those are. But um, again, probably not for this cheap. So that's the third piece of low-hanging fruit. Um, and uh, I, I hope you guys, if you're in the market for speakers and you're looking for stuff, try to find a pair of Monitor 7Bs. Uh, old Polks with the Peerless Tweeter. Not a copy, not the later Polk design tweeter. And uh, and then if you haven't uh, recapped them, recap them and make sure to uh, epoxy your um, your uh, your mid base. Let it dry for 24 hours, just a regular two part epoxy. And, and that's it. So hopefully this has been helpful and uh, I'll let you guys uh, uh, if you want to leave a comment or with similar experiences or you have these and you did something different or, um, you know, if uh, somebody wants to leave an amen, <laughs> you've done this too, let me know. Uh, but hopefully this was helpful and informative. See you guys later.